Hi, this time I'm going to explain what is inverse dynamics and how you can formulate them. Maybe, maybe the, this inverse dynamics techniques is going to be the most often used useful technique for you when you're taking this course, when you're studying human motion. Okay, so I'm going to I'll let you know how to formulate the inverse dynamics and um, I'm going to also introduce uh, two other forms of uh, inverse dynamics and um, metrics formulation for numerical solvable, like a MATLAB implementation. Okay, so inverse dynamics means dynamics is a uh, backward, right? So to do so, to understand what is inverse dynamics, I should first explain what is forward dynamics, right? So forward dynamics is simply F equals MA solving. Like uh, once your force or torques are given, you can figure that out, what's going to be the uh, resultant motion. So forces are given or torques are given. The source, the, source, the cause is given. Causes are given that you'll figure that out what's going to be the result, the, the motion. So inverse dynamics is kind of opposite way. So when your motions are given, uh, you're wondering what causes that motion? What are the forces that generating that for, uh, motion? And what are the torque that generates those angular motions? Okay, like a human being. So you can easily measure human motion, right? Using optical tracking systems and so on. And you want to figure that out. What would be the force applied at the lower back or at the knee joint or the ankle joint, etc. So the inverse dynamics is the opposite. So simply for a single uh, inverted pendulum, like upright posture, you can measure the theta and you can take a second derivative of it. And then you can just plug that in to figure that out what's going to be the torque applied at the ankle joint. That's the inverse dynamics. Okay, so um, uh, suppose we have a more segments than a single one. So suppose you have upper limb and lower limb. Okay, I want to figure that out. Torques at the ankle, torques at the pelvis. How can I find them? So first, I should draw the free body diagram. The and then all the contacts will apply the forces. So I have a lower segment contact with the upper body and the lower body. And the upper body only has a contact with the lower segment because uh, contact with the air, just reaction forces are zero, right? So uh, from them, I can obtain the equations of motion like um, F1 minus F2 is going to be um, F equals MA kind of thing for the, the lower body and upper 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 body. And for, for also the moment equation with respect to the uh, central mass. So there are torques one and torque two and also torque component by the internal uh, contact force at the joint, the joint forces. OK, now um, inverse dynamics, usually your kinematics are measured. OK, so your velocity and angular accelerations or accelerations are all measured. OK, and you you are supposed to figure that out what are the corresponding. Um, well, not the corresponding. What are the force and torques that generate those motion? OK, and since the finer segments, the reaction force from the air turns out to be zero. OK, I can easily start from here. So these are known. These are actually measured and you can simply find out what's going to be the F2. OK, the, the hip joint forces. OK, and since you know, uh, since you are obtained, this has been measured and you can uh, you estimated the F2, the hip joint forces from the um, upper body equations of motion, you can easily figure that out what's going to be the um, joint force at your ankle. OK, so this is kind of uh, from the outermost segment to the inward. So it will be called as inward iteration. OK, same thing happens for the moment equation here. You have unknowns for the torques and the forces. However, force has been solved from your Newton's law, like from this um, uh, inverse dynamics. So you can uh, those are all known values. So from your measured value and your estimated value, you can figure that out. What's going to be the torque to at the hip joint, at the pelvic joint, and then by plugging that value in, you can figure that out. What's going to be the anchor torque? So it's kind of inward matter, like from your outmost, outermost segment, calculated one by one by iteration. So that's the inverse dynamics formulation. OK, so for n segment, you can actually do the same thing repeatedly, right? So you have um, all the segments, um, equations of motion, and the final segments is easy because reaction from the force uh, from the air is zero. So you have a whole series of first and second and, you know, end segments equation starting, and then all those accelerations are measured, kinematics are measured. Then you are starting from the very last segments and calculating what's going to be the Fn. You just keep plugging those values to the previous segment so you can finally end it up getting anchor joint forces. 
Okay, same for the Moman equation. Okay, you are you measured all the angular acceleration. Those are the measured value, and I'm interested in what's gonna be the torque that's generating those motion. And you can start with the final, the last segments because uh, inertia uh, uh, reaction force from the air turns out to be zero, and then your all the joint forces are already calculated from the Newton's law, F equals ma. Um, inverse dynamics. So from those known values, you can figure that out. What's going to be torque applied at the outermost segment and just plug that in uh, to the previous segments up to the point where you can finally end it up calculating first segment joint torque, the ankle joint torque. So that's what we call uh, the name inward iteration came from. Okay. Now, so it's pretty much easy as far as you have a uh, good measurement. Uh, usually, the motion captures are measure your position. Okay, so to calculate, to use uh, those value to perform these uh, inverse dynamics, you have to actually have to calculate the angular acceleration by taking the second derivative of your angle measurement value, and usually differentiation um, causes the noise amplification. For example, this is the position measured by the I, uh, the marker, I guess, uh, from uh, from cer certain motion. And if you take the first derivative, I'm not really sure if you could see, there are many, uh, like a noise amplified, right? Here and here. And then as you can see, the uh, orders are pretty large. And if you take the second derivative, wow, the acceleration looks really, really noisy, right? So um, since it's inherited uh, characteristics for the signal, so when you take the derivative of the harmonic, simple harmonic, when it, as far as it uh, has a um, higher frequency, uh, it'll, you know, multiply by those frequency components. For if compared to the lower frequency components, your high, higher uh, frequency components will be um, contribute more uh, greater for the magnitude of the velocity and same for the acceleration. So your velocity or your acceleration will increase with the frequency omega. So usually the noise are high frequency, so dif uh, differentiation will amplify the noise. Usually we um, resolve this issue using the um, low pass filtering. Other than those um, inherited um, noise amplifying issue, your numerical differentiation also causes the error. Uh, that's what I'm going to explain in the next slide. Okay, so for example, suppose that you, these are your measurement, and, and suppose you want to find out what's going to be the um, uh, time derivative of X at point x naught. Uh, rough estimation will be maybe you can calculate the slope of your x measurement and x zero naught plus delta x measurement. So you can approximate as um, f x naught plus delta x minus f of x naught divided by the delta x. However, um, looking, um, recalling your Taylor series expansion for the f of x naught plus delta x, it's going to be f of x naught, and then your first derivative, and your second derivative, and the square term, and third derivative, and the cube term, etc. Right? So if you rearrange this, because we have this first order derivative term that we are interested in, you have those finite difference formulation, your approximation mentioned here. Okay, and the rest of terms exist, right? So these are actually considered to be an error for the numerical differentiation, finite difference method, right? So since this is pretty large error because you have a order of one, okay? Now, uh, how can we avoid them or how can even, you know, reduce those error, numerical error? Think about the point adjacent to the x naught as the magnitude of minus delta x. So you have x minus delta x, the Taylor's expansion with respect to the x naught is going to be similarly uh, like we have first order derivative, second order derivative, and third order, right? And since this one, the first order, is what I'm interested in to obtain, here you have a first order term here and, and here. By combining this two, so if you can subtract from the first one to the second one, you can actually approximate your first order derivative as f of x naught plus delta x minus f x of not um, x naught minus delta x. And here instead of delta x, we have a two delta x. And and you have um, the other terms cancelled out, and you only have uh, you will ha okay. So 
this this one has been cancelled out. What you can have uh, is a third um, derivative term in the cube, which is divided by delta x. So you have only a delta x squared term. So those are the errors. So compared to the previous two-point measurement um, numerical differentiation, which has an error order of magnitude of 1, you have error order of magnitude of 2. So since delta x is usually considered to be very small, this error is a lot smaller than the other. Right? So by uh, taking more point data points, you can reduce the error. Okay, And then maybe uh, taking out a th a, um, three more data points will give you a smaller error. So at certain point, it will converge. So you should think about formulating good numerical differentiation um, code in MATLAB or, or for your own. Okay. And then when you are taking more data points, uh, you should also think about how you can define the derivative at the very end.